so today I will be presenting to you the work within the Brain at Home project, which is a project that is run by Leiden University Medical Center together with uh, SIGN, which is a specialist epilepsy center within the Netherlands. And STU Delft, we are involved primarily in the EEG processing or collection and anal analysis um, for uh, studying migraine. Okay, so what do we want to do within the Brain at Home pro project? Well, within the Brain at Home project, we aim to validate uh, easy to use and unobstructive uh, technology for at home measurements of brain health in order to improve uh, the monitoring and the, uh, the monitoring of attack sensitivity, susceptibility, and also improve treatment. So this is what we ultimately aim to do within the Brain at Home project. And we specifically focus on two types of diseases, which are migraine and epilepsy. Now, migraine and epilepsy in terms of pathophysiology are very similar, but today I will focus on migraine. So what is migraine? Well, migraine is not just headaches, as some people may believe. Migraine is a complex neurological disease which affects about 15% of our society. Now, because of the recurrent headache attacks, migraine has a massive economic, uh, social, and personal uh, impact on people. Now, obviously, we can think about wanting to diagnose migraine using all complex techniques, including EEG. But uh, people do, do not just want to know whether they suffer migraines or not. They actually also are pretty much, or they would be helped a lot by actually being able to predict their attacks. So to get an early warning sign for their attack. And therefore what we're interested in is in the question if there is a critical transition towards an attack that we may be able to detect and also provide feedback on to, to a patient. Now, what we're wondering is whether neurophysiological studies like using EEG can help us in answering this question, whether there is a critical transition towards the attack and whether we can use this to provide information to a patient about an upcoming migraine attack and basically warn them. Okay, so it's not for me to tell you in detail about the pathophysiology, uh, pathophysiology of migraine. That's just not my expertise. But what is important to know that there is very much going on within the brain during a migraine attack. There's changes in hypothalamic networks, there's changes in the trigeminal system, there's changes in thalamocortical uh, pathways or, or interactions. And that all really affects how a patient is feeling. Um, now we distinguish different types of migraine. We do, do primarily distinguish migraine uh, without aura and migraine with aura. And this migraine with aura is specifically characterized with um, changes within the occipital cortex of the brain, which then mimics, or at, le at least it presents in the patient as getting visual disturbances. Now, these visual disturbances are generally associated with increased excitability, specifically within these uh, occipital neuronal networks. But we do believe that uh, generally there is an enhanced neuronal network excitability within the migraine brain. Now, whenever you speak to migraine patients, they may often tell you, well, um, I had a stressful period and then I went on holiday and I got a migraine attack, or I had a few days of bad sleep and I got a migraine attack. And, and they may believe that those actually were triggers for, um, for the migraine attack. Now, they may actually be triggers for the migraine attack, but we don't believe they, they are the cause for the migraine attack, right? So what we think is that within the brain, there's so much going on that at some specific points, there is a reduced triggering threshold for these migraine attacks to occur. And therefore, the hypothesis in general in our work is that the onset of attacks is a result from interactions between this lowered or reduced uh, migraine threshold together with the fluctuating trigger factors that are, well, around um, just during your, uh, your normal daily life. Um, so from this hypothesis, well, based on this hypothesis, we basically perform our work. Now, to summarize this in a maybe a, a slightly easier diagram, um, imagine on the y-axis, we have so any type of bio biomarker here. And in a healthy control, we would just find this biomarker to be stable over time. So the value doesn't change much. Now, what we do expect in the migraine patients is that generally there may already be an increase 
an increased value for this biomarker, but this biomarker value may change towards an attack, towards a migraine attack. And this is what we like to attack, what, what we like to detect. Like, does this critical transition, does that exist? And then can we actually use it to provide feedback to a, to a patient? Now we're primarily interested in doing this using EEG. And EEG obviously provides us one way to study uh, network excitability, neuronal network excitability. For example, by using evoke potentials. Now, within the migraine field, uh, what is often used to test and uh, to test the visual system is uh, stimulation of the visual system by either pattern stimulation or flash stimulation. Now, pattern stimulation is a is a way of stimulation where a participant uh, watches a, a monitor on which a checkerboard is presented, and this checkerboard is alternating between black and white. So the the squares are basically alternating either uh, black or white. And there's a rapid transition between the two. Or we can use flash stimulation as we do in our studies. So with flash stimulations, we um, uh, fit participants with a specific set of goggles in which we have uh, LEDs. And these LEDs are just uh, flashing intermittently. Now we can do that in, so this, these flashing protocols, we can do that in, in several different ways. So we can use a single uh, the visual evoke potentials to result in evoke potentials, or we can use single stimuli um, where we repeat them every so many seconds. And every stimulus will result in an evoke potential that we can eventually average. And we can look in this evoke potential at like amplitude and latencies to compare migraine patients to healthy controls, for example. Now we can also use habituation protocols. And in habituation protocols, we basically present participants with a series of stimuli, and then we divide these stimuli, uh, the series of stimuli up in blocks and assess the average AVO potential within each block. And what we generally find also in healthy controls or primarily in healthy controls is that when you continuously present a certain stimuli, in this case, a, a light stimulus, this nervous system gets used to it and it responds weak and so it's attenuated. So over time, the response towards these flash stimuli is actually attenuated. Now, finally, we can also use steady state visual evoke potentials where we stimulate the visual system with a repetitive flash uh, somewhere between three and 30 Hertz. And we actually look in the power spectrum of um, specific EEG electrodes to see whether the brain follows the, the stimulation frequency. So for example, when we use a 10 Hertz stimulation frequency, is this stimulation frequency also visible within the power spectrum of a electrode over the occipital cortex, for example. Now, a lot of work has been done with this stimulation protocol within migraine. And pretty much these, uh, this work uh, confirms, or some work confirms, the initial hypothesis that we started with, or that the general uh, migraine uh, researchers started with, which is that there is an enhanced cortical excitability in the migraine brain, which may become evident from an enhanced evoked ev a potential amplitude uh, of migraine nerves compared to uh, healthy controls and a lack of habituation. So this means that whereas in uh, healthy controls, there is a reduction in this evoked potential over time when we repetitively stimulate, this does not happen in migraine patients. So there may be an impairment in this habituation uh, response. Now I present here two studies which basically support these initial hypotheses to, uh, which were, um, which were uh, postulated, but there's probably as many studies which provide contra uh, the, the, the contrary, so which provide opposite evidence, the, either that there is no change in cortical excitability of that, or there is reduced uh, excitability, and there may be no uh, habituation or there may be just normal habituation in migraine patients. So it's really altogether a mixed bag of findings that we have within this migraine literature. So we wanted to approach this differently and we wanted to introduce a new stimulation protocol in order to see whether we could make a difference there. Now, what is this stimulation protocol like? Now, this stimulation protocol is a so-called CHIRP stimulation protocol. Now, within this protocol, what we do is we stimulate at a whole range of frequencies between 10 and 40 hertz within a six second time frame. So we start actually with 10 hertz. So the first three stimuli are repeated at 10 hertz. 
And then the stimulation frequency progressively increases up to 40 Hertz throughout the six seconds. And in order to assess cortical excitability, we then use 12 uh, repetitions of this, uh, of this uh, stimulation series. Now, what is the main advantage of this uh, stimulation uh, paradigm is that we basically can assess the response of the brain among a great range of frequencies covering both alpha and beta bands. Now, I'm just going to show a, a short animation of what this actually looks like for a participant in our work. And if you're sensitive to light flashes, I would advise you to, to look away for a second. So this is what it would actually look like. Um, so the flashing starts slow, and then it starts increasing in frequency up to 40 hertz. So we just look at it again. And this is what the participants actually experiences. The subtle difference being that in our stimulation protocols, the color of the light is actually red. Now, what do we then find? So we actually performed a study within the hospital where we invited both healthy controls as well as migraine patients. And we presented them with this chirp light stimulation protocol. Um, now, if we look at the EEG response at the occipital cortex, we can see a clear uh, following response of the brain um, that obviously coincides with the presented uh, stimulus. Now, we can look at this response within the time frequency domain. And what we see is then compared to baselines so prior to the stimulation, we see a clear response over uh, the 10 to 40 Hertz. So the, 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 the stimulation frequencies that we stimulated with, but we can also see a response at its harmonics, which are between 20 and 80 Hertz. So there's a clear response, uh, both in the migraine brain, as well as in the, uh, the healthy, the healthy the brain of a healthy control. Now we can characterize, we can basically summarize this, this time frequency diagram uh, by averaging uh, over time and over specific frequencies. And we can do that for uh, the overall response, or we can do that specifically for the driving response, so the stimulation frequencies and the harmonic frequencies, so the frequencies between 20 and 80 hertz. So we separate the, those uh, different responses for our analysis. Now, what did we find? Well, our initial finding was actually quite disappointing and maybe also in line with all the literature that was out there. So we didn't really find any uh, difference in uh, the response of the brain. So this is all compared to baseline between the different groups. So there's no change in uh, the power compared to baseline if we compare migraines patients with or without aura and healthy controls. Now, it's important to realize that all the studies and the results that I've been, been uh, informing you about so far are studies that are being performed in between migraine attacks. Like, it's very difficult to predict a migraine attack and therefore also very difficult to measure patients during an attack or anything close, anywhere close to an attack. So we generally perform these studies while patients are feeling well and they can come to the hospital and Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So this is all in between uh, migraine uh, in between migraine attacks, and this may indicate that there's actually nothing special about a migraine brain when we assess them in between attacks. Now, uh, coincidentally, we did measure some patients that uh, reported within two days after they had been measured to us that they had suffered a migraine attack. Now, there were, I think, in our total uh, set of uh, 20 patients, there were five or six patients that, that reported this. So we decided to basically cluster the migraine with and with all our patients and then separate out those patients that came back to us and said, well, within 48 hours after that I uh, came to your, uh, to your hospital, I actually had a, a migraine attack. So we started looking at their response and initially for the overall power, so the power across, um, uh, across all time points and uh, uh, frequencies, we didn't really find a difference either. Same holds for the, uh, the, the, the stimulation frequencies. And then finally, we also assessed the harmonic frequencies. Now, this is where it started to get interesting. Because specifically at these harmonic frequencies, we did actually see that there is an enhanced response in uh, patients that are close to developing a, an attack, so within 48 hours prior to the attack, 
compared to healthy controls and compared to patients that did not get an attack within 48 hours after our measurements. And this is obviously really promising for us, specifically with our aim in mind to provide an early warning sign for an upcoming attack. And this actually demonstrated proof to us that there is, an, a, there is the possibility to obtain a measure that we can use as an early warning sign for an upcoming migraine attack. So now, how did we follow up this finding? Now, now we basically um, got to the difficult situation that this was a coincidental finding. Like we didn't really aim for it, but we found it just because of luck. And like I just said, like it's very hard to, to predict a migraine attack. So we cannot just uh, get, in patient, get a patient in and just hope that uh, they would get an attack. That would be a bit unethical. We, we would have to recruit many, many patients and measure them. And then only a small subset of them would get an attack and we could use that data and the other data would be sort of useless. So um, we wanted to take a next step and say like, well, we may also want to, um, to actually uh, measure people, uh, patients longitudinally. Uh, but then we need a way to predict a migraine attack. And there is, a, there is a way to predict a migraine attack. And that is the case in menstrual migraine. Now, many people, many women, they actually suffer of menstrual migraine um, where they get a migraine attack um, aligned with their menstrual cycle. And there's a lot of research going on within Leiden University Medical Center in this, this particular type of migraine. And therefore we also have a huge database of patients where we actually sort of know um, how often they get a migraine attack. So we have monitored patients for several months using uh, uh, e uh, electronic headache diaries. And then we can sort of approximately predict when their next headache attack would occur based on how regular their menstrual cycle is. So we specifically target these uh, patients now and we started to measure them um, in the week before their predicted migraine attack. So we had a predicted migraine attack based on their menstrual cycle. And we started to measure them like either a day, uh, well, six days before and then four days before, two days, one day, and then on the day that we predicted the migraine attack. And obviously not in everyone the attack occurred. In some, the attack occurred early. So we had only three measurements. In some, uh, we, we had it after five or whatever measure, uh, over management, uh, measurements. And we did acquire some other data, but that's not uh, relevant for now uh, along with this. Um, now, what did we find here? And this is basically just a single example because we haven't opened up all the data to ourselves yet. Um, but we did open up a patient, uh, just randomly a patient that did not suffer a migraine attack within the measurement period and a patient that did. Now within this patient, uh, within this patient that did not suffer a migraine attack, when we look at the overall response, the, the driving frequencies or the stimulation frequencies or its harmonics, we just don't find any differences across the different sessions. So that's just the way it is. We don't see any, any differences across sessions. Now, if we then start to look at the patients that or a patient that had a migraine attack, then we see already in the overall response, like towards the fourth session, in this case, the purple line, there is an enhancement co compared to the third and the second session. And we can even better see this in the harmonic frequencies, where you see a clear enhancement in the response in the fourth, so the yellow line, and the fifth, the purple line uh, session that were close to uh, the, the participant's migraine attack in this case. And this finding very much aligns with the finding that I presented to you earlier, where we had an en enhancement in the uh, uh, EEG response within 48 hours prior to an attack. So this again is very reassuring. And it basically, um, if, this, if this result stands across all our data that we're gonna analyze soon, um, it opens up the way to Set, a, set one step further to take the next step. And that would be actually measuring EEG at home, uh, such to enable participants to assess their brain health at home independently, um, and then get an, get an image for how sensitive they are for a migraine attack. So we are currently in the process of starting this, uh, this, uh, this uh, study up. 
uh, we already performed one measurement and we're basically using a very similar timeline um, where we uh, basically follow a patient initially to sort of get an image of the predictability of their attack. Then we um, predict their attack. And then based on that prediction, we do the measurements prior to that predicted uh, attack date. And we do that in patients' home. So we bring our TMSI saga together with our uh, light stimulation setup in a custom built suitcase to the patient's home and measure them uh, and measure them around their predicted attack date. And obviously we hope that we will find uh, very similar uh, results as we have done in our hospital based studies. But there's obviously lots of complexities uh, with measuring in a home environment that we probably need to overcome. So this is all part of the brain at home project and things that we want to work out over the next few months. So basically, just to summarize what we did and, uh, and where we are. Um, so we did a lab-based cross-sectional study um, where uh, we found some initial uh, evidence that there is a measure that we can use to predict a migraine attack. And we translated this into a longitudinal study, also in the hospital, where we confirmed this study. Um, now within the Brain at Home project, we're looking at doing a home-based supervised study also again to confirm these, uh, these findings. And we hope eventually down the road that we could provide people with systems that enable them to measure their brain health at home independently and get better control over their migraine attacks. And within this framework, we're obviously very happy to see the developments within TMSI. Uh, so the development of the APEX, which I think really brings independent brain health monitoring at home uh, a step closer. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank TMSI for the invitation again, and also all the collaborators uh, within this project. Thanks, Mark. And I guess that's my uh, cue to take over uh, from here. So let me get uh, my presentation up and ready for you guys. Um, I hope you can all see my screen, and if not, please uh, correct me, Colette. Um, welcome to this part of the webinar. Um, in this part of the webinar, I'll be introducing our new amplifier, Apex, um, to which Mark already gave a very nice uh, introduction in what kind of use case it may be uh, suitable for. Um, for today, I'd like to start giving you a very short uh, demo in the form of a video. Um, so I'll get that up the screen right now. And there we go. Um, so what we did is we created a little video uh, to show you um, how you can use Apex and what the signals may look like when you use it. Um, so let us get started on what you need. Um, from left to um, clockwise, um, we have first Apex, Infinity Gel Cap, the Teams I Bluetooth dongle, uh, the Apex Cradle, and then finally the USB cable. And I'll get to the different specifics later in this presentation. But first let's uh, prepare our subject, which uh, actually was uh, me during this uh, session. So first make sure that the impedance were okay. And now we start to record some rest EEG. Um, as you can see already on the screen, although it seems that I'm sitting relaxed, there's a little bit of muscle activity there. Um, the next thing that we would like to show is some blinking where you can see these signals coming in. Um, one thing you can note uh, within uh, these signals, I've paused it for a little bit, is of course that uh, there's an average reference applied. So you will see the uh, eye blinks in the signal in a variety of channels. Um, and that's something that's good to note within this uh, recordings. Um, next up, we uh, collected some resting EEG as well, but then by closing my eyes. Um, in this case, uh, you'll see some alpha waves coming in, uh, originating from the occipital lobe. Um, as Mark has already been stressing, this is a um, lobe related to the uh, visual input you get. And in this case, the neurons start to fire synchronously because uh, there's no input coming in. What's also possible and what's really needed um, to have a study such as Mark introduced is to have a trigger input. 
Um, so I can also briefly show you um, how we did that um, as an example. So in this case, uh, some triggers were given to me, which are shown on the bottom right, to which I had to lift one of my hands or both of my hands or not react at all. Um, trigger input is something I'll show later in this presentation, but it's important to know that there's a variety of um, bits to which you can send data. So that you can log a variety of events on the trigger. Then a final uh, use scenario, which we have envisioned um, aside from the trigger is a wireless connection. And for that, we use a Bluetooth. So in more challenging conditions, you may also uh, choose for your subject to be really away from a computer, be for instance, in a more realistic setup, um, standing in some corner as I just did. So let's go back to the presentation. Introducing Apex. Well, um, you have already seen it um, in a sneak peek version. So now let's really dive into the specifics for Apex. Apex is available as a 24 or 32 channel amplifier to record EEG signals. We really optimized the different specifications so that it's suitable for um, portable use scenarios, um, giving a size that's uh, roughly similar to a smartphone than just uh, two or three times as high. Um, there's basically two interface in which active communication with a PC is going on. The first of which is the uh, USB interface where you're on a wired connection. And the second is a wireless interface which uh, makes use of a Bluetooth protocol and the dongle that I already showed. And finally, you could also directly record the card by just simply pressing a button um, in which, um, for instance, an unsupervised uh, use scenario would be the case. Uh, importantly, Apex comes with the exact same uh, connectors as Saga has in terms of what accessories you can connect. So um, as Mark said in his presentation, they have used at this point the infinity gel cap, and that's something we can again use for Apex. So that's um, an important characteristic. Diving a bit more into some technical specifications, um, like our previous products, we have again chosen to uh, employ our well-known active shielding technology to really um, limit the occurrence of movement artifacts and increase the signal quality of it. Um, other than that, the output data is in 24 bits resolution, which makes it possible to also fully capture the DC and slow components of the EEG. Uh, and that's uh, actually something you can see in our cho uh, choice for the analog bandwidth, which runs from zero to 350 Hertz. And to do so, um, we have specified Apex for a sample rate of 1000 or 1024 Hertz. Another uh, interesting feature for Apex is the uh, joint uh, acquisition of impedance and uh, sample data. And that actually can be used as kind of a first objective uh, quality metric. And it's actually something we use uh, to give some feedback uh, during acquisition where you're not really um, focusing on evaluating the signal quality that is coming in. And a final um, speci specification for APEX is the fact that it has tr four different trigger bits uh, so that up to 16 different event types may be directly logged um, together in sync with the uh, EG data. In order to make a really user-friendly product, uh, we have tried to uh, focus the specifications on a plug and play kind of mechanism. Meaning that if I would insert the USB cable, um, your device is directly ready for you to open uh, a connection to it and really start using it. Other than that, we've really tried to make it possible to limit the amount of steps you would need to start a recording. So there's limited configuration options uh, available on the device. And if you want to start a card recording, you can just hit the rec button and it will start recording. And uh, a final thing that we really try to optimize uh, at an early stage is really look into the different um, indicators and buttons that they're intuitive to use. So um, 
we think we've managed to do that and uh, are happy with uh, the outcomes for that. A final thing we uh, wanted to really leverage is the size and the wearability that comes with that. And for that reason, we have chosen to uh, develop the cradle. And the cradle is actually um, a small bracket which you can place the apex uh, where it will be fixed, fixated in. And by using a strap, you can um, wear it around different places on the body. So for instance, like a kind of shoulder bag just just shown in the figure on the right side of the screen. I indicated earlier that um, we have used the same type of uh, connectors to uh, as to Saga, but to briefly um, introduce you to what kind of accessories will be available, I've created a, a nice overview for you. So the first and most typically used uh, setup would be the integrated gel cap, so the Brainwave Infinity cap. Um, which comes with either a 32 or 24 channel variant, uh, such as we also um, have for the Apex. Um, next to this, uh, we offer uh, ring electrodes. So if you would uh, have some more degree of freedom in selecting which channels you want to record data from, um, this can be integrated with a, uh, a cap like EasyCaps. And another one is uh, the water-based electrodes, which can be really nice if you're looking for a measurement setup, which you want to get started on uh, rather quickly. Uh, so short preparation times, uh, it's still a good quick sig signal quality. And a final set is to uh, use the C-grids, which are uh, suitable if you're really looking for behind the ear EEG, um, and also um, give the possibility for a little um, less obtrusive um, view. So maybe a more realistic environment uh, recording could be possible with such a, a type of accessory as well. Um, the cradle is really an accessory to um, accommodate various uh, use scenarios and then specifically the portable use scenario. And the trigger cable is an accessory that's uh, used if you're going to look for evoked potentials uh, or event-related potential studies. In terms of our software support for Apex, we'll predominantly be focusing on uh, extending our TMSI Python interface, which offers uh, a direct interface between the uh, software development kit uh, of Apex and the Python programming language. And that will come actually with various examples to get you started, uh, which show you how to record data and also visualize uh, both the impedance and the uh, signal data for it, so the EEG data for it. And what we've actually seen over the course that uh, the Python interface has, has been available, that we have a growing user community who also um, help others out and uh, try and give examples of their own to extend the possibilities of this uh, software. A final uh, software application that will be uh, available in the market is a uh, graphical user interface uh, that offers a graphical user interface where we'll really be focusing on uh, the workflow that uh, may be used. So for instance, if you're recording data, it will be guided uh, through the application by selecting that path where an impedance data comes up, data will be acquired and in the end um, will be saved and uh, are, is used for analysis purposes. And on the other hand, you may um, configure or download data and uh, make sure that it's in the place that you require for it. Well, with that, I hope I've been uh, successful in giving you a nice uh, introduction to Apex. I'd like to thank you for your attention and also I'd like to uh, hand the word back to Colette. Thank you, Joost and Mark, for your presentations. Um, I would like to now open it up for questions. Um, currently, we have no questions in the chat. So if you would like, or in the Q&A, if you would like to put your questions, uh, please feel free to do so. I previously saw someone with their hand up. Um, in the participants, but now they have lowered their hand. If you still have the question, please feel free to raise your hand and I will allow you to talk so you can ask your question directly.
I saw that Leo has a question. I will allow to talk. Hey guys, uh, great presentations. Um, Mark, uh, I have two short questions, if I may. Yeah. Uh, one is that you talked about excitability uh, of the brain being lower in uh, migraine patients. Higher, yeah, higher. Yeah. Or higher, uh, yeah. at least change. Yeah, well, it depends. The threshold lower, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's right, um, that's right. Yeah. How how would it help if you looked at the DC levels of the uh, of the signals, which of course is tough to do, I know, but but that might be an indication of uh, of something like excitability changing. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a very good point and, and something that that actually was on our research agenda uh, some years ago, uh, quite extensively, where we were interested in. Uh, in, in studying DC changes, because it's also related to some other phenomena that is present in, uh, in migraine, which are uh, cortical spreading depolarizations. So it, it, it's something that we would still be interesting in, interested in, but I think primarily from also a fundamental point of view, from basically better understanding what is going on uh, during a migraine attack. Um, and it may also be valuable to, to add to uh, a prediction model for migraine, but but yeah, that's something to uh, to see whether it's possible at all to to measure it. Yeah, and it's very difficult to measure. That I yeah, know, exactly. but, but still, when you have enough data, you can probably you know kind of do some uh, some smart stuff with it anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's that, absolutely yeah. right. And the other question I had was more uh, the method. You uh, you do your uh, stimulation, and then you have this chirp stimulation, yep. for example. Um, how how sure are you that you are not uh, influencing your own patient cohort in the sense that you provoke a little more migraine by doing the stimulation? Yeah, it's a it's a very good and common question uh, because like. Like it, like they are probably more sensitive to light, uh, and we may provoke a, a, a an attack. But like we don't believe we provoke attacks, and that's primarily based on like we have done these tests uh, way more. Like this is just a cohort of twenty patients, but there's much more data also from the past with with similar protocols. And I think we get migraine attacks like within forty eight hours in less than five percent of of the of the of the cases. So. I would then struggle to say that we provoke attacks by providing light stimulation, but we cannot exclude it either. No, I tend to agree with you, but it's just something uh, that that people will raise, of course, because yep. the light is known to. Uh, that was already the case when people were doing flashes uh, in EEG many years ago, right? So, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a, it's it's a fair question. Um, we don't have any any indications that we do. Uh, provoke attacks, uh, but maybe in those people that are close, it, it will definitely not help. Yeah, yeah, and, and the other thing that I think about now is that with the goggles, you're of course never sure that people are not closing their eyes during the goggle stimulation, right? Which will still give you some stimulus, but a lower intensity, I, I imagine. Oh, that's a good point. They're, they always close their eyes because otherwise it's way too intense. Oh, they do. Yeah, they okay. always have their eyes closed because otherwise it's it's very hard to uh, to cope with. Okay, because when when we did the goggles in uh, VEPs in the old days, we always assumed that people or they were told to keep their eyes open, but uh, of course yeah, you yeah, can't yeah, yeah. really check whether they do. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's right. But in this case, we we asked them to close that because like the the flashes are so close by, like they're in yeah. these goggles and they're only a few centimeters yeah, yeah. from from the eyes. Uh, I think like when I did it with my eyes open, I even got tears in my eyes. So it's, it's just uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, so you instruct them in fact, to do that. Yeah. And that, I think we didn't do it in the old days, but maybe you could, you could literally change the current a little bit so that you had slightly lower intensity on the goggles of course, yeah. on the, on the LEDs. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, Leo, for your question. We have one in the question and answer. It is from Cameron Smith from Cortec. Um, he says, thank you for the great presentations. And this is for Yoast. Does Apex use Polybench QRA or a different GUI-based software? 
Thanks for the question, uh, Cameron. Um, Apex doesn't use the Polybench QRA. Uh, we'll build it on top of uh, the Python interface and really leverage all of the uh, different processing capabilities and uh, visualization aspects that come with uh, the Python language. Uh, one example maybe that um, I could, could foresee coming in this application that's currently not possible without Polybench is set up, for instance, is how we may uh, at some point, like we have it available in the Python interface, use a uh, lab streaming layer as another means to share data with, which now is only supported in the uh, Python interface, but at some point may come available in this uh, Python-based GUI as well. Thank you, Jos, for your answer. Are there any more questions in the chat or if anyone would like to raise their hand and say it themselves? Cameron says, thank you. Uh, Leo has raised his hand again. I will unmute him. I just wanted to say great presentation, Joost. Uh, very nice. Um, I was just wondering that PZ seems to be very neutral to the uh, to the eye blinks, which makes some sense, of course, given its location. But I was still surprised to to see it like that, and it appeared that you had the same with the uh, EMG artifacts. Which specific ones were you? Uh... Yeah, when you showed the tracings, then. You had some eye blinks in the beginning, and then the uh, the um, PZ channel was almost silent to the eye blinks, which makes some sense because the position it has on the head is, is probably, you know, quite neutral compared to the other electrodes around it. But it also seemed to be the case with when you had some EMG uh, in your. Uh... Yeah, I, I specifically had the feeling that the. Uh, F set, which was the fourth trace on the screen, was rather um, unaffected by it. And I um, suspect that the average um, caused by the eye blinks on the prefrontal channels mm -hmm. um, and the number of other channels that were active actually made sure that the um, average for jet channel was roughly similar to the uh, uh, the eye blink average, so to say, so that was yeah, yeah. Uh, subtracted from it. So I think that's what uh, what caused uh, that channel to be to be rather insensitive to the uh, specific channel. Yeah, I thought it was PZ, but 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 I may have re uh, read it wrong. You know, it went quite quickly, and maybe it's my eyesight that's not so good anymore. So, but there was definitely one channel that, of course, is more or less in the in the middle of everything that seemed to be rather quiet, quiet for the eye blinks, but, but also to the EMGs. So, yeah. Yeah, for the EMGs, I think if it's indeed that F set, then it would make sense. Yeah, uh, it would make to sense. Me because there's not too many uh, muscles affecting exactly. that probably. Exactly, yeah. So uh, I guess that's then that channel uh, specifically. Yeah. All right, then we can move on to another question in the Q&A. This is from Silvano. Does Apex produce poly5 files only like most other TMSI devices for as far as I know, or are there other file formats possible? And if not, are there standardized conversion tools available? Thanks for the question, Silvano. Um, this again depends. Um, on what we have available uh, in the Python interface as well. So all of the data formats that will come available in the Python interface um, could be uh, included in the uh, with Apex as well. Um, Poly5 will be the, the native support um, as it's a 32-bit uh, data format. However, we have, um, with our support of LSL, have also added an uh, XDF type uh, data format, which may be used 
Um, and we're actually working on um, having a standard conversion tool for EDF files, so then a 16-bit data format. So that will also be coming up in the latest release for uh, Python. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Joost. Um, we have another question from Leo. No, I didn't have more questions. Okay, I see their hand was raised, so. Let's oh, maybe I that. need to uh, do something about that. I can also lower it, that's okay. Thank you. All right, I believe those are all the questions from the audience today. I want to thank you both Yost and Mark for giving your presentations. Um, I have one more screen slide to share. Um, to thank everyone for joining today's webinar and also to let you know um, that for a limited time, you are able to get an early bird discount if you pre-order Apex. Um, on our website, you can fill out a form to receive 20% off. And once you fill out the form, you have up to six months to use the discount to purchase Apex. So please do not hesitate to fill it in. Um, again, I would like to thank Mark and Yost for their nice and interesting presentations and for taking the time to give their talk today. Um, and thank you all for being present. We will be sending out a follow-up email within the next week with a link to the recording of this webinar for you to see if you would like to again. Um, and for that, I would say goodbye and see you all next time.